And we're back with another weekly health, fitness and fat loss Q&A with me, Gav, your host of this weekly live, whether you're getting this on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on YouTube, wherever you are, I salute you. Come in and say hello. It's open Q&A this week. Ask me anything about health, fitness, fat loss, mindset, flat earth, conspiracy theories, but we're also going to focus on sleep. We're going to look at sleep um, in particular, you know, why we need it, how much we need, um, what are the problems caused by not having enough sleep and how we can maximize our sleep and get the best quality sleep. Because it's one of the most important parts of fat loss. It's it's often ignored. It's free. We can all do it. But most of us don't get the quality sleep that we need. We spend far too much focusing on nutrition, exercising, going to the gym, all those things, which are great. But we need to look at our sleep It's the big piece of the puzzle all right we've got panda is in panda hi from uh namaste from india also yeah sleep tell me about your sleep if you're coming into the chat uh tell me where you where you're listening in or watching from let me know where you are It'd be good to chat to you all right we'll give it a couple of minutes to see a few people coming in um it does increase our mental health panda absolutely Six hours. Yeah, I mean, I get about six hours. Probably could do with a little bit more, if I'm completely honest. Um, can you hear me okay, Panda? Put your th uh, Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Right, so if you're just joining us, um, Samuel has just joined us. Uh, if you've got a question, please pop it into the chat. Any topic you want on health, fitness, Fat loss, mindset, uh, flat earth, other conspiracies. I say that because um, I've got a friend who's a flat earther. Um, he's into, big into the conspiracy theories. I always like to take the piss out of him. I'm also going to be talking about sleep. Uh, I might mention coffee as well. I put a, a poll uh, literally yesterday or the day before. said, what, your favorite, what was your favorite beverage in the morning? You're a coffee addict or you're into green tea or normal tea or something else. And I think the vast majority said they love their coffee. Okay, uh, Panda's asked a question. Let's let's pop that up on the screen. Panda has said, please suggest how to inspire community to understand the value of good sleep and its effect on work-life balance. Okay, well, the answer to that would be to start with a great book. Panda, I would recommend getting a book. I haven't got it to hand. I should have. It's called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. And it's one of the best books I've ever read on the topic. It's literally jaw-dropping. Right? It's one of the only books that every page is like, oh, my God, I can't believe that. It's just, like, amazing. Uh, two or three years old now, uh, but Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep, that would be the, um, the best start. But, you know, there's a couple of things that we can do for sleep. I think most people are struggling with their sleep. Let's look at some of the ideas that we've um, – that I've got – that I've gone want to talk to you guys about. Okay. Um, so I've got three sort of tactics that can help us get good sleep. If we look at um you know why people struggle with their sleep, especially in this uh, the modern world, you know, there's so many distractions, there's so much going on, the social media. Um, but one of the big things that's stopping people getting to sleep is the fact that we're on our laptops far too late and we're on our cell phones on our iPhones, whatever you've got. And um, one of the first tips that I would say to get the best sleep would be to eliminate the use of um, phones, laptops, and even TV. Stop watching television two hours before you go to bed. Now, that's harder, it's easier said than done for most people. And I have to admit, I don't always do that myself. But I try and get off my screen time uh, phone, laptop, but at 9 p.m. And I go to bed around about 10, 10, 30. And the reason because of this, because it's artificial light. And what the artificial light, the blue light, will actually interfere with the production of melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that's produced in the pineal gland. It's right in the center of our brain there. And it's signaled by when it starts to get dark. So as soon as it starts to get dark, the brain switches, this hormones gets released, and it just makes you feel sleepy. Now, what the blue light does, it blocks that. It blocks the production of melatonin, 
which then causes problems to a lot of people. It stops them falling asleep as quickly as they could. So that's the first tip. Second tip would be to avoid caffeine after 2 p.m. For most people. Now, caffeine has got what we call a half-life of around five to six hours. And what that means is that five to six hours later, 50% of the caffeine will still be in the blood. So I'm not sure how much caffeine is in a very strong, so a double shot espresso, maybe two, let's call it 200 milligrams of caffeine. Five to six hours later, a 100 milligram is still going to be present in the blood. So if you're a light sleeper and sleep is problematic for you, it's going to affect your sleep. So 2 p.m., because then most of that caffeine come 9, 10, 11 p.m. is going to be out your blood system, out your system, out your bloodstream, and it shouldn't cause a problem. Then he wants having a coffee 4, 5, 6 p.m., and weirdly enough, coffee after dinner is probably one of the worst things you can do for your sleep. Now, a lot of people say, well, I can drink coffee late at night. It doesn't seem to affect me. Um, you think it's not affecting you. It is. Your bo everyone's body works pretty much the same. You might be thinking you're having good sleep, but you could have so much better if you cut your caffeine out. Now, I'm not saying eliminate coffee altogether. It's one of my favorite drinks, and there's lots of you know, psychoactive benefits. And when I mean psychoactive, it means it can change your mood. It can alter, it can make you excited. Um, it can st it's a stimulant. It affects our body and how we run. That's what I mean by psychoactive. I'm a big fan, big fan. I have three cups every day, three cups every day, but I make sure the last one is before two o'clock because I value the quality of my sleep. That's number two. Coupled to that, number two still is alcohol, okay? I would avoid alcohol where possible up to two hours before you go to bed. Now, a lot of people say, well, I sleep well when I've had a couple of drinks. You do tend to sleep, fall asleep quite quick, but it's it's rather it's through sedation rather than having fell asleep from natural uh, tiredness and melatonin kicking in, all the hormones that we release when we fall asleep. So it's more like a sedation. But the problem is with alcohol, you'll actually wake up a lot more, go to the toilet a lot more. So you're, you'll never really fall into a deep sleep cycle. So rather than the cycles of three to four hours over the night, we fall into a deep sleep cycle and then we come back up again. We do that all night. With alcohol, you never tend to fall deep. So you, fair, you stay fairly shallow, wake up a lot, wake up and in the morning often feel very, very tired. So alcohol as well, avoid alcohol. And one of the biggest tips, number three, I guess, would be going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time the next day and try and do that as many days of the week as possible. This will set what's called the circadian rhythm. And your circadian rhythm is just the, the, the cycle that your body likes to stick to, okay? Now you can change that rhythm uh, or you can rather fight against it by staying up late, getting up early, and it messes it up and we just don't sleep as well. We don't get the rest that we deserve and that we need if we buck the system. Now the best way to set that circadian rhythm is to actually go to bed at the same time to pick the time that works best for you with your schedule and get up at the same time. Now, my schedule or my routine is going to bed at 10 or 10.30 and getting up at 5. So I either get um, seven hours, six and a half to seven hours is what I get most nights. Sometimes if I go to bed at half 10 and then get up at 5, a little bit more tired. 10 to 5 for me is great. Get up and go to the gym. Seven hours works well. And I, I, I say I try to do that. I do, I do it every, I do it seven days a week, including Saturday and Sunday. And because I know that your body loves routine when it comes to sleep. So by going to bed at the same time, it's automatically going to start to rise, wake up at the same time. So there's my main three tips about getting a great night's sleep. There's, there's a lot more that we can do, but if you stuck to those three, I think you would, if you suffer from bad sleep, the quality of your sleep, the length of your sleep, and the how you feel in the morning would be vastly improved just by sticking to those three points. Right, any more questions for anyone else? From anyone else, rather. Hello, Angelica. Very quiet today. Ali, enjoyed that. Thank you, Ali. If you've got any more questions, if you're just joining uh, the live, what do you want to know? Health, 
fitness, fat loss, mindset, sleep, um, building muscle, anything you want to know in and around the health and fitness space. If you've got questions, good. I've got the answers. So uh, fire away. Let me know where you're from in the chat. Um, Jared. Hello, Jared. Seven hours is plenty for me as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, seven hours is good. You know, they say seven to nine hours. Personally, nine hours for me is a bit too much. You know, I have to go to bed very, very early to get nine hours to get up at five o'clock. Work back, I'd have to go to bed at um, 8 p.m. I can't go to bed at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. to get up at five. I, I also don't like staying in bed. I feel like once the day has started, I want to get up and crack on with it. I don't want to be in bed till seven, eight. Uh, I'm used, I'm got into the 5 a.m. club about seven, eight years ago. Jared says, how do you get a good rest when you're traveling? Yeah, well, actually, it's a good point there, um, Jared. And this is interesting. And I got this. I'll be honest, I didn't know this until I read the book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. And he said that when we travel or when we stay in a hotel for the first night, we don't have the best. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the first night in a new hotel, we tend to not have the best night's sleep. And this is because um, only half of our brain will actually shut down properly. And it's actually a um, threat detection system that we've got inbuilt. And every animal on the planet has it, has it, has this threat detection system. And it's incredible. Obviously, it's to do with evolution and predators. So when we go to sleep in a brand new bed, because we're not used to the, the environment, the sap, the surroundings, maybe the bed is probably not the, the mattress that we're used to at home. We, we don't fully relax, so we tend to not get the best night's sleep. So how do you get a good rest when you're traveling? Well, the first thing to do, especially if you're flying long haul or any, you know, you're flying from continent to continent, is to um, get onto the current time zone as quickly as possible and take melatonin. The best thing to do when you get off the aircraft is actually to avoid alcohol on that day entirely, um, to exercise within a couple of hours of getting off that aeroplane, despite wanting to go to the hotel and eat loads of food and then go to bed, go for a walk, get out in the sunlight, because it's the quickest way to set reset this, your circadian rhythm to the current time zone that you're in rather than the one you've traveled from. And then take melatonin. You can actually take the supplement melatonin, take two to three milligrams, um, 30 to 40 minutes before you go to bed. Be very careful with melatonin. It's not something you want to get into daily. You don't want to make it habitual because it is a hormone. And by taking too much melatonin, you could actually interfere with the production of your own melatonin. But a little bit on, you know, when you're jet lagged is one of the best things you can do. Um, but the thing to do the, to get the best rest when traveling is just to take care of your health, which means exercising, eating as well as possible, um, not drinking too much alcohol. I know that all those things are probably when you go on holiday or if you're traveling in a hotel, you tend to drink and have more rich food and maybe not exercise as much as possible, certainly if you're going on vacation. So we're fighting against it, but that's one of the best ways to help with jet lag or, you know, getting the best rest when, when traveling. But interestingly, um, certain sea dwelling mammals can fall asleep with one part of their brain can go into a deep sleep and they can actually keep the other part of their brain awake. So they've got the ability to do that. So they can actually get the rest that they need, but half of their brain will actually stay awake um, and being alert for predators and, and threats, which I guess if you're um, a smaller mammal, you're, the threat would be some type of shark or you know a whale or something, I don't know. But interestingly enough, we can't do that as well as the sea-dwelling mammals. Yep, get the melatonin. Um, Jared has said, typically set my watch with a time zone. I'm heading to as soon as I get on the plane. Good idea. I have to try the melatonin. Absolutely. Go to any decent health food store and get um, supplement melatonin. Weirdly enough, it's actually banned in the UK. We can't buy it. We can order it from Europe, but you can't buy it in the health food shop in the UK. I don't know why. I don't know why. You know, we've got some strange laws. Different countries have got different laws about um, supplementation. So we can't actually buy it over in this country. I get it ordered on the internet from the US 
or when I'm over in the US, but absolutely one of the best supplements. But do you be used sparingly? In fact, I'd only use melatonin when I'm flying long haul. Thanks for that, Jared. Any more for any more? If you're just joining, um, pop your question into the chat, say hello, let me know where you're dialing in from, so to speak. Okay, some interesting, some more interesting facts about sleep. And this is particularly going to be helpful for men. Okay, men that only sleep five to six hours have the testosterone levels of a man that's actually 10 years older than them. So let me repeat that. If you sleep only five to six hours, which is a couple of hours more than we need, your testosterone is at the level of a man that was 10 years older than you. And as we know, testosterone is the primary hormone that men have. Now, women have it as well, but they have about, on average, 10 to 12 times less testosterone on, produced on a daily, daily amount. And testosterone production will slowly decrease as we get older. <clears throat> Certainly when we get into our 30s, no doubt in 40s, and by 50s, it's very, very, it's coming down quite low. So we need to maximize that because it's responsible for building muscle, uh, for burning body fat, partly, for having drive, feeling happy. It can aid with depression. Uh, a very low level of testosterone for a man is the recipe for disaster. Feel doesn't feel like a man, can feel quite depressed, moody, irritable, um, fat deposits. So we want to maximize testosterone. And the best way to maximize testosterone is to get good quality sleep and heavy weight training and get a good source of fat, dietary fat in your diet. But we'll get to that another time. But looking at it from a get into bed perspective, if a man only has five to six hours of sleep per night, his testosterone is the equivalent to a man that's 10 years older than him. So if you're 40 years old, it's like having the testosterone of a 50 year old and 50, obviously 60 and, and so on. You can do the maths. That's not what we want. That's just from five to six hours, okay? Now, secondly, the lack of sleep is one of the biggest causes of the onset of Alzheimer's. You know, there's a lot of people say, oh, um, they wear like a badge of honor. I'll sleep when I'm dead or, you know, sleep is for babies. And it's almost like this badge of honor that they've avoided sleep and, you know, burning the candle at both ends. That's great. But if you want to speed up the process of potentially getting a degenerative disease, cognitive degenerative disease like Alzheimer's, then skip on your sleep. It's one of the, the worst things for that. So be careful of that. OK, another interesting fact, and I got this from the book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Being awake for 20 hours, which is quite restrictive in terms of sleep is the same as being over the drink drive limit with alcohol. I'm not sure what the actual um, deciliters or nanomoles per in the blood is for the drink driving, but it's about three drinks. Three or four drinks is going to take you over that legal limit for driving in most countries. I know it's slightly different in certainly in the UK to it is in North America and the rest of the world, but it's about three or four drinks. So you're, Reaction time, memory, ability to function is going to be impaired to the same level as if you had three or four drinks just by being awake for 20 hours. So when someone pulls an all-nighter, when your boss tells you to pull an all-nighter, you just want to tell them no. Now, obviously, you're going to get the sack and you need to get a job done. But just be aware that this is how important sleep is for us or at least be aware of how impaired you will be by having a lack of sleep, okay? Now, the biggest one with regards lack of sleep is we usually see high levels of obesity in people that don't sleep well. And there's a few reasons why. There's a few reasons why. And it's not because 
what most people think it is. Now, we burn body fat when we sleep. That's our preferred source of fuel when we're sleeping. We don't burn carbohydrates. We burn body fat. And it's only a small amount. I'm not actually sure of the amount of calories we tend to burn. But it's a very, obviously, you can imagine we're, we're usually prone on the bed. We're unconscious. Um, yeah, functioning on a very, very low level. We burn a very, very small amount of body fat. And the problem is when you get poor sleep is it usually leads to overeating the next day. It can really mess with two important hormones. Two important hormones that most people haven't heard of. Leptin and ghrelin. Now, I know they sound like two characters out of The Lord of the Rings, but they're not. Leptin is our satiety hormone. Ghrelin is our hunger hormone. Now, what happens when we get poor sleep? These hormones are all out of whack. Okay, they get skewed. They get messed up. So you've got one hormone that's saying that you're not satisfied. So leptin gets messed up, saying, I'm not satisfied. I need to eat more. And you've got your ghrelin that's saying you're still hungry. And they're both playing off against each other. You've got one hormone screaming, saying, I'm not full. And you've got the other hormone saying, eat more. So from a obesity perspective or gaining weight or even trying to burn body fat, it's a recipe for disaster. You will often find your appetite is increased when you've had a bad night's sleep. And people use it, oh, I just need some carbohydrates, or I need sugar. And certainly I know from a personal perspective, this is from a purely anecdotal from me, not from everyone else. This is my own personal experience. When I've had a very bad night's sleep, less than five hours, my resolve is a lot less. I think, fuck it, I'm just going to eat that. You know, I look at the food stuff in the fridge that I probably wouldn't eat at lunchtime on a normal day, and I'm like, go on then. I'll have the carbs. Or if I open up and there's some biscuits or some chocolate, I'm far more likely to go for that poor choice of foods. That's not to say that I should avoid them all the time, and I definitely don't. But do I need that chocolate biscuit or the four chocolate biscuits at 2 o'clock on a Monday afternoon? Probably not. Do you? Probably not. But your resolve is there because it's your hormones. You, it's almost like you've been hijacked by your hormones. Your hormones are saying, eat more, I'm still hungry. So it's not your fault. Well, it is your fault because you've physically gone and done. You've actually had to take action. But your hormones are massively affected. And we, we see that across the board. When we look at uh, studies have shown that the majority of obese people, guys and girls across the board, tend to have very, very poor sleep patterns because they, those hormones are causing them to overeat. All right, anyone on the chat, drop in, let me know where you're from. If you're finding this uh, useful, if you've got any questions on health, fitness, fat loss, sleep, building muscle, mindset, flat earth, conspiracy theories. If you're there, let me know. Any questions? We've been covering sleep. We've been covering sleep. I've covered quite a bit there. So if you're coming into this at any point halfway through, go back and watch it. There's some good good topics. Great book. I've recommend I've said this before. I recommend the book by Matthew Walker, Why We Sleep. Fantastic book. Another good resource by Sean Stevenson, a really good book called Sleep Smarter. Very, very good book. It's probably an easier read. Uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker is written by, a, he's a scientist, sleep scientist, neuroscientist. Um, so it's quite heavy and it's not written in the most uh, user-friendly way, but it's fascinating. You're welcome, Jared. Jared has said great stuff. Absolutely welcome, mate. Thanks for tuning in. Um, any more for any more? 25 minutes in, very quiet today. Very quiet today. What's going on? Thursday. Thursday, half five in the UK. What's that about midday in um, Eastern Eastern time and about 9 a.m. in um, California IA on the West Coast. All right, we've got Sally. Sally's asked a question. Hi, Sally. Sally has said, recently started tracking macros and I'm finding that a lot of foods I didn't think had a lot of carbs actually have a lot more than I thought. I'm trying to do the two-on-one ratio. Well done. I'm having trouble getting that protein versus carbs. Any tips? Okay. Um, look, the two-on-one 
ratio for anyone that doesn't know. Obviously, Sally, we've spoken. Um, and you've got the book. Well done. The 211 is a great fat loss formula that I like to adhere to when I'm helping clients with, with their calories. And it really refers to grams of protein, carbs, and fat. So I ask clients roughly, and it's a it's a rough guide, and sometimes it'll be a bit more, sometimes it'll be a bit less. The two refers to grams of protein. So we're looking for, on average, the client to be aiming for two grams of protein per kilo of intended body weight. Now you can work that out in pounds, but the formula is in, in kilos. So if, let's say, the client is 90 kilos, which is, gets to about 190 pounds, and then trying to get to 70 kilos, which is about 150 to 160 pounds. So trying to lose 30 pounds, maybe, maybe a bit more. They would aim for, they're trying to get to 70 kilos, they would aim for 140 grams of protein, roughly one and a half to two grams of protein per kilo. Um, the ratio works with fat, so carbohydrates and fat. They're aiming for one gram of carbohydrate for intended body weight, same with fat. And then we would often increase the carbs and decrease the fat slightly depending. So the, the question is, I'm having trouble getting enough protein. Now, as you found out, carbs are in everything. And pretty much everything is carbohydrate based and fat. It's very easy to get your fat and your carbs up there. They're very hard to get protein. Now, question for you, Sally, um, tell me what, what are you eating? What are your protein sources? Um, if you're not vegetarian, you can get it quite easily, but you need to go out right and get it. Now, the, the best choices would be animal protein. So beef, chicken, um, lamb, pork, fish, all seafoods, eggs, dairy, like good quality Greek yogurt is a very good source. You could even pr put in a protein shake or some quality protein bars to be used sparingly. To, there's a supplement to your diet. So that would be the best way of doing it. Um, how many grams are you aiming for? Just remind me of what you're actually trying to do. Hopefully that's helped. If you're a vegetarian or vegan, it's going to need a little bit more trickery. It's going to need a bit more planning and, and thoughtfulness around getting those protein levels up. But with a bit of practice, you should be able to get those levels up. You should be able to get those levels up. But give me some context. Tell me what, um, what you're eating. Um, Give me the, the actual context of what you're trying to trying to do, how many grams you're trying to get, and what you're eating at the moment. And I can add a few things in, give you some, some suggestions. All right, here we go. Sally has said, eat a variety of protein, grass-fed beef, excellent. Fish, chicken mostly, sometimes do protein shakes. Trying to hit 40, 60 grams of math is right. What, 60 grams per day? I think you're going to need a lot more than that. definitely more than 60 grams but even if it was 60 grams you could do that in two meals two meals of 30 grams but i would be aiming for a lot more than 60 grams be close to 120 for protein protein shake is 30 grams in itself if you have two scoops of whey protein that's gonna be about 25 30 grams so i think it's more than 60 grams sally i think maybe it's 120 120 yeah absolutely I would say it was close to 120. I'd say it's close to 120. Yeah, 120 grams. Look, you could, the average chicken breast is probably going to be about 30 grams of protein. Three eggs might be 18, 20 grams of protein, depending on the size of the egg. A protein bar, 20 grams. Protein shake, 30 grams. So it's going to lead a little bit of thoughtfulness around that and planning those meals out. But all those sources, if you said grass-fed beef, fish, and chicken, turkey, if you like it is fantastic sources fantastic sources so how many if you um aiming for 120 just screaming you they don't get enough well give me an example of what you're eating give me um tell me what you're having for breakfast lunch and dinner and i'll see where we can make um some adjustments
Let me know, Sally. Tell me what you're having for your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. Just write it into the chat, and I'll be able to help you and tell you exactly what you need to do. Have you lost any weight since we last spoke? That's more important. And here's the thing. Protein is important, but what's more important than protein is total calories. So total calories will always trump that. So although we want to be having that protein up, ultimately, even if you're getting 60, 80, 100 grams of protein, it's going to be enough. But what would be the overriding factor and whether you lose weight or gain weight would be the total calories you take in over the day and even over the, the best part of the week. So you can actually eat a lot more calories than you're aiming for in the day as long as you reduce those calories and balance and get into that calorie deficit over, over the week. You're still going to lose body fat. But let me know if you've lost any weight since we actually last spoke because that would be the uh the goal right well i don't know where everyone is today it seems to be very very quiet oh here we go sally has said Breakfast doesn't always happen. What it does is tip of the eggs. Okay, first thing there, I would make sure breakfast happens. Because if you're not having breakfast, you then got lunch and dinner. So you're down one portion of protein. So I would make sure you get breakfast. When you say eggs, how many eggs? Two, three eggs. Two eggs is going to be 12 grams. Possibly be aiming for three. Maybe with something else, you're having some toast or something. You actually use brown rice and a protein. Awesome. Dinner, usually some meat and a side. But I think it's because of the veggies I've... Not use leaves, so that's probably where the carbs are. Um, what are you having? What veggies are you having that are bumping the carbs up? But if you have your breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you had 25 to 30 grams with each meal, which you could with a fairly decent sized protein, let's say it was 30, that's 90 grams. Is it optimal? Maybe, maybe not. But you're not trying to build as much muscle. Um, and you're not a powerlifter, a bodybuilder, a strength athlete. So well, ultimately, if you're getting a good amount of protein, if you're getting 90 to 100 grams a day, that would be more than enough if you were controlling your calories. I know that fat loss is your main aim. So um, I think it'd be okay. Of course, if you came and worked with me on my coaching program, we could get down to the nitty gritty and find out exactly what you need to do. Um, and accelerate those results. So I'm ready whenever you're ready to come back to me. In the meantime, I'll help you as much as I can, of course. It's just me and you, Sally, at the moment, I think. I'm actually going to give it uh, five minutes more. Five minutes more. If no one else comes on, we're going to end, end the live. Okay, cool. Sally has said, I lost about a pound since I started tracking. It's only been a week since I finished the book. Keeping the calories in check most days, though. Usually two hard balls, eggs, possibly over easy. Potatoes, yams, I think they're main culprits. Yes. The potatoes, not bad. They're going to be putting those carbs up. Limited on veggies. Because not the whole fam eats all the ones that are really good for us. Don't worry about too much about your carbs going higher than what we said. Worry about total calories. How many calories are you aiming for each day? That's more important than, than the actual carbs and protein within your diet. Oops, I just accidentally um, played my intro. But you know what? I didn't play the intro, so I'm going to add that now. There we go. This is the intro that I should have played at the beginning of the live. See, I like to be taken for dinner and drinks first before you slip your hands in Swanika. Call me old-fashioned. I'm kind of a big deal. So apparently I'm going live in three seconds. Two... One. Boom. Boom. All right, we're back. 
<laughs> Completely forgot to pay that intro. Jared has asked, how many calories do we burn by just being alive? Um, good question. The, the answer is uh, it's different for every single person. Depends on size, shape, the amount of body fat, the amount of muscle. So everyone would burn a different amount of calories every day. So your, um, your BMR, base on metabolic rate, that's the, the calories that you would burn if you got out of bed and just laid on the sofa, did nothing. And that would be a set amount for most people, but it would depend on the size of the person, literally the amount of muscle, the amount of body fat. So there's no answer to that. Uh, the government, they over estimate the amount of calories we need i think because uh, on the back of food sources in the uk they say the average man needs 2500 calories per day um probably don't need as much as that for most people again but it really depends if you're six foot four 260 pounds and fairly muscular you're going to lose use a lot more than 2500 calories if you're five foot three um and female and you weigh 130 pounds you're going to lose a use a lot less or need a lot less so it really depends it really depends how do we estimate bmr the only way to do that without going into the lab where you can actually find out for sure is to track your calories jared and if you if you're gaining weight you need to reduce them a little bit. If you're losing weight, you need to increase them. So it's almost guesswork. So you don't really need to know your BMR, but you could track your calories. And if you ate the same foods every day for a week, give or take, and tracked it, and let's say you're eating 2,000 calories a day and you haven't put any weight on and you're doing the same exercise, you can kind of get an idea of your BMR. But your, your BMR is also total daily energy expenditure is also going to be the energy that you just need to function to stay alive, but also the exercise you do. And also what we call NEAT, which is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. That's the stuff you do in the other 23 hours of being alive, you know, the, um, walking the dog, playing with the kids. So it really depends. So th the answer is very tricky. We, you, it's very hard to, to work this out, but the closest way of getting to that answer would be track your calories and to see the outcome. Am I losing weight? Am I gaining weight? Is my weight staying the same? But you'd have to do the same activity um, on a weekly basis or even for a couple of weeks to establish a baseline. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, any more questions popping in? Does that answer that question, Jared? Hopefully it does. All right, it's very quiet today. I'm going to give it another couple of minutes. If no one else comes in, I'm going to end the live. Hopefully, you, if you're coming in at um, some point, you can check out what I said about sleep. There's some good tips on um, how to get good sleep and some ideas around sleep and testosterone. So any final questions? Um, looks like everyone's away doing other things. But I'll be back next week. There we go, Jared. You're welcome. You're welcome, my man. All right, hopefully if you've tuned into this live or you're watching the recording, I hope you enjoyed that and you've got some ideas around sleep. I'll be back next week, same time, 5 p.m. Um, in the meantime, take care and I'll see you soon. See, I like to be taken for dinner and drinks first before you slip your hands into my knicker. Call me old-fashioned. I'm kind of a big deal, for sake.